I just want to take a couple minutes and, and close out. So I'd like to thank everyone for the incredible work uh, that's been put into making this event. Brent, you and your team, uh, our gifted PAO folks, I mean, really, uh, really first class. Right? And then for the division commanders and the leaders uh, around the Army and those who've uh, chimed in from, uh, from really all over the world uh, with, our, uh, with our virtual component. Thanks for, thanks for spending the time with us and uh, sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, and your experiences. Right? Hey, so as you all know, here at the Maneuver Center of Excellence, it's our mission to train future infantry and armor soldiers and leaders, develop doctrine, and test and implement changes to our Army's maneuver force. So as you can expect, we spend much of our time thinking through the topics we've covered these past few days, which makes your participation in this event even more valuable. Every one of you did, I mean, every presenter did, did really did a tremendous job of driving through uh, the themes that we wanted to cover and the thought-provoking remarks uh, helped feed questions and provide feedback that we can use uh, in our work here. You know, and, and to echo General Flynn's comments and, and General Abrams talking about the value of our alliances and our coalitions, I'm really especially grateful uh, for our allied partners who joined us this week, Matt uh, Cansdale from the UK and, and Chris Smith you know, from, from Australia uh, with a brief stop there in Hawaii. Uh, really, really, really helpful uh, to further our partnership. Right? And we truly, we truly know that we in the West, our great group of nations, truly are the bulwark of civilization against barbarism as we see it starting to play out in Eastern Europe right now, right? It is, it is, it is our community of nations uh, that truly guard uh, civilization. Hey, so I'm gonna delve into some history in a minute, but the one, one thing history continues to teach us is that no matter how powerful one nation becomes, how mighty its military, how, how large its land holdings, it's only a matter of time until other nations begin to challenge its strength. And so we know that the true strength, therefore, does not come from technology, does not come from fielded forces. It, it comes from partnerships and alliances that are strong and enduring, right? So last May during his opening remark, uh, remarks at the Indo-Pacific Land Power Conference, uh, General McConville, our chief of staff, uh, put it best, right? And his quote is, a strong military comes from strong relationships together with allies and partners, and we have many more options collectively than we do as individual nations to maintain strengths and weaknesses. And one of the, one of the comments uh, Ian made earlier was that that's one of the advantages we have uh, over our adversary. General Flynn said the same. You know, our, our great asymmetric advance, advantages over the PR, uh, the People's Republic of China is, is the fact of our, our friends and allies uh, all over the world. So all of you here help frame uh, the problems we consider here every day, focused around our primary mission of preparing infantry and armor soldiers and leaders to fight and win on the future battlefield. But before I get deeper into that, I'd like to start by looking backward. Right. We, we often tell ourselves it's 1973, and that's, a, and that's a great analogy to look at with the birth of TRADOC, birth of FORCECOM, the big five systems, and air land battle. But that's a very comfortable narrative for us Americans, because we know that that only ends in success, that ends in the army that, that gives us Desert Storm, that gives us uh, the, the, out, you know, the beginnings of the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think it's more challenging to believe, what, what, if, what if we're wrong in that analogy? What if it's the first decade of the 1900s? What if it's 1910, right? If you think about that period of time, that's the last period of great power peace that came about as the result of the post-Napoleonic wars, right? The Council of Europe, right? That hundred years of great power peace from Waterloo to the assassination of the Archduke, you know, that was foreseeable at that time, right? The, the world order was beginning to fray. All right, so the forces of peace began showing signs of weakening with conflicts like the Spanish-American War, the Boer War, the Russo-Japanese War, and finally the First and Second Balkan Wars. Right? Imperial Germany's challenge to the geopolitical rules coupled with destabilizing advances in military technology like the Mauser rifle, the Maxim gun, rapid fire field guns, dreadnought, and, and of course, powered flight, the airplane in 1903, together made the conditions of a decaying world order more volatile. This, of course, would ultimately lead to the two most devastating wars in the history of humanity. So recent comments have been made by many 
from writers at The Economist magazine all the way uh, to General Milley indicating that we are right now experiencing a fraying of the world order that we've enjoyed the past seven decades since 1945. A great power peace is fracturing and our period of overwhelming military supremacy is being challenged. Considering this, along with our recent emergence from Iraq and Afghanistan, today is really a combination of both the technological uh, evolutions and geopolitical uh, challenges. But the takeaway from here is we've got to move from here to a future of deterrence through strength. So what those periods share in common, 73 and 1910, is the character of war changed in the years that followed, brought about by developments in weapons and other technologies. And as the dust settled, both sides had those weapons. Right, so by, by 1914, everybody's got machine guns. By 1918, everybody's got tanks and airplanes, ships and submarines, and so on. But what made the difference, and it's been, it's been hammered home here, were the men and women in those formations, the men and women serving in those armies, and their steely-eyed determination to adjust and to finish the fight, right? the human will. Today, we find ourselves, again, wrestling uh, with a series of challenges to how we see the future of war. Right? Lieutenant General McMaster, uh, you know, he coined, he coined one, of his, one of his fallacies, one of his five fallacies was the vampire fallacy, or the idea that just refuses to die, the idea you can't kill. And, and this is, and we touched on it, this is the revolution in military affairs, this is effects-based operations. We see it today in systems warfare. Right? This is Douay. This is Warden's Five Rings. This, this is this belief that air power will solve all of our problems and that we won't have to put our men and women in the, in the dirt. And we know that as soldiers, that that is not true. Now, now to be clear, I'm not a Luddite. You know, we, we need the most advanced technologies in the world. We need the most, tech, the most advanced technologies that American industry can and has always provided. But we must be clear-eyed that they in themselves will never be enough. As I said on the first day of this conference, we need to be the best equipped, most well-trained, and determined soldiers in the world who are willing to engage our adversaries in the crucible of ground combat. They represent the only method that currently exists to defeat enemy armies, to seize critical terrain, to control populations in order for us to deliver the political outcomes our nation asks us to go to war to achieve. Which leads us back to the discussion about the changing character of war. Today, as Russia masses its forces on the Ukrainian border, you know, we must be ready to meet that threat. John Antall gave us a great picture of how drones and autonomous systems are changing the character of warfare, right? We, we know that the information component of this, all of those videos of strikes from autonomous systems on vehicles, albeit out in the open, you know, we're filling our social media. What will that impact in the next war when videos of American soldiers being engaged by our enemies are on our handheld devices? Many of you may remember the videos of the Baghdad sniper, right? Al-Qaeda was posting those on the internet. And that was in the earliest stages of social media, right? So it made me think of the Mel Gibson quote from Patriot, right? This war will be fought not on the frontier or on some distant battlefield, but amongst us, among our homes. Our children will learn of it with their own eyes. How are we preparing our force our people, our nations to deal with that. In Newton's law, motion every action has an equal and opposite reaction. In warfare, this means either developing new weapons and equipment, changing our doctrine, changing our formations to adjust to the changing conditions of the battlefield. Again, going back to Chris's comments, this means hey, if the open areas are too dangerous, if either we or our enemies cannot hide from the swarms of armed drone, drones and bombs and rockets, then we'll need to change the way we fight, possibly moving to the shelter of cities, possibly 
advanced camouflage, but we've got to be ready to be able to cross that no man's land. We have got to be prepared to blow a hole in those anti-axis area denial capabilities so that we can bring the close combat force to bear, to endure, and to prevail. And we've got to do this by mastering our fundamental tactics, the employment of our assigned weapon systems, whatever they may be in the future, and understand the roots of our doctrinal foundations, and we'll have the agility to adjust course quickly after absorbing the first blows of combat, whether we win that first battle or not. As Don Sando said yesterday, we should be putting far more effort into the training of our soldiers than developing new weapon systems. Okay, We've got to do both. Systems will help us prevail on the battlefield. We absolutely need to adopt the principle of autonomous initial contact, right? As General McKean said, why lead with your face? And as we do that, we've got to update our doctrine. We've got to describe how we need to employ uh, all of these emerging capabilities in our formations so that they have time to ingest these new capabilities, perfect how to use them, and train on them before they go to war with them. Rudimentary training and tactics like camouflage, concealment, noise and light discipline, hand and arm signals, fire and maneuver are going to be more important than ever. Do, do you remember your first road march as a young lieutenant under radio listening silence? We've got to get back to that kind of fundamental. And so we at the Maneuver Center have been transitioning the focus of all of our doctrine and training to make sure that all of our soldiers and leaders have a foundation of knowledge and training grounded in large-scale combat operations. We've, we're also redesigning our organizational structures to be manned, equipped, and ready to win in competition and, if necessary, in conflict. We're preparing our force to win the next fight. And in the next fight, the last mile of combat will still belong to the tank infantry team. And we still culminate with infantry soldiers standing on the objective, supported by armored formations. As change dominates the headlines today, we must remind ourselves of what does not change, the very nature of war. And we explored it here in these past three days. Precision targeting tied to robust sensor grids can help us defeat our adversaries' anti-access and area denial capabilities. Advanced information collection systems can gather and disseminate an abundance of intel to increase situational awareness. Hypersonic and other long-range fire systems can target enemy indirect fire assets. However, the purpose of all of these systems will remain the same. To help close the deadly gap that exists between us and our foes, so that highly trained men and women can use time-tested and proven fire and maneuver tactics to defeat them, to root them out, to seize the terrain they hold, control the populations to secure victory. Now, as General Abrams reminded us this morning with the quote from T.R. Fehrenbach, in warfare, you can bomb an adversary, turn their land to dust, but in the end, you must meet them on the ground the way the Roman legions did, by putting your soldiers in the mud. That is an eternal truth. Hey, thanks again for spending your time with us this week. Really, really valuable for all of us. We have a lot of work ahead of us here at the Maneuver Center to take what we've learned this week and put it into uh, all of the efforts we have going on here. So thanks. Thanks again. Travel safe home. And uh, let's hope for peace in Eastern Europe. One force, one fight.